So now that we've talked about state tomographies, we'll go on to something I think a little more relevant for a lot of the people in this room. We're going to talk about process tomographies. So for a process tomography, basically you have some black box. You can send a state in and a state will come out, but you don't really know what's happening inside the black box. It could be a wave plate or an entire experiment, it doesn't really matter. But the idea is we want to determine how that process will affect any given quantum state. The way we're going to do that is essentially performing a, almost a tomography of tomographies. We're going to take six input states that we know, in this case, uh, rather than just some random unknown input state, we'll take six input states, we'll put each of them through the process, and then we'll take a tomography of whatever comes out. And we'll use the tomographies of whatever comes out in order to figure out what the process would do to anything. But kind of the uh, sort of the more, I don't want to say complicated, but kind of the weirder part about dealing with process tomographies is just discussing, frankly, what a process is and what you're actually measuring with your tomography, what it is that the output is. For, for a state tomography, we know it's pretty obvious that what's coming out is a state. But for a process tomography, we need to actually explain it a little bit more. So in pro for processes, we're all familiar in quantum mechanics that states undergo unitary evolution, that some process will act on a quantum state, and it just corresponds to a unitary matrix being multiplied th by the state. Could be time varying, could be not, doesn't really matter in this case. But in quantum information, it's, we can generalize this to basically an incoherent sum of these unitary processes. So that would be this right here, where instead of just having one matrix that multiplies our input state, we can now have a sum of a bunch of these different processes going on, so long as we satisfy this normalization condition. This condition basically ensures that the density matrix that comes out of the process will still have a unit trace. There are some theories that deal with non-trace preserving uh, processes, but we're not really going to talk about those today. Some examples um, that may be familiar, may be unfamiliar. So if we have a half wave plate that's at zero degrees, that's going to take V to minus V, and so take a, D and A and flip them. In terms of an actual unitary process, that just corresponds to taking a Pauli Z operator and multiplying it by whatever state. But a little bit more complicated, we can actually talk about channels such as dephasing processes, in which we can take our quantum state and essentially throw out all of the coherence of the state and return it to some essentially unpolarized system. And in this case, the actual channel looks like an, a probabilistic split between going through no channel at all or going through a half wave plate at zero degrees. And what that'll do to a density matrix is basically just kill all of the off diagonal terms in the density matrix. Destroy all of the, as we discussed before, destroy all of the coherence <coughs> in the state. So this is all well and good as far as what a process is, but what are we measuring in a process tomorrow? Oftentimes you'll hear thrown around the word chi matrix, the phrase chi matrix. You know, that's, that's what all the code will spit out. That's what everything is. But what is a chi matrix? So if we have our channel that is just described by some sum of unitary operations or some sum of operations, basically we just want to decompose each of the individual operations into some known basis. So for the most part, we'll use Pauli matrices, so I, X, Y, and Z. And this is a complete basis, so any of these individual operations can be split up and written as a linear combination of Pauli matrices. Then if we shove everything back in, we just end up with some, a pro our process looks like 
a Pauli matrix process, but with a complex matrix that controls the weighting of all of the individual combinations of Pauli matrices. And this, this matrix with, which controls all of the weighting is the chi matrix. So if you have a chi matrix for your process, all you have to do is shove it into with a bunch of Pauli matrices or use it to weight all of the Pauli matrices in your process and that'll gen always uh, give you the process, at least assuming you don't have some uh, interactions with the environment. Those we're not really talking about here. But, like I said, this just means that your state can be completely determined by this single matrix which it will be the purpose of our process tomorrow. So how, how are we gonna actually go about performing a process tomorrow? We're gonna start with our six input states, which follow the same rules as choosing our six measurement states. Generally speaking, again, you'll probably try and do H, V, D, A, L, and R. And then we're gonna perform all of the same measurements as a state tomography for the output of our channel for each input state. Now this will give us 36 total measurements, six input states, six projections. You may need to do some measurements beforehand um, in order to actually identify all of your input states if you're not sure you can actually make, you know, say H, V, D, A, L, and R. Uh, but for the most part, we're gonna just assume you, know, you have 36 total measurements and then, much like the case of a state process tomography, we're going to construct a tunable test chi matrix. This is the exact same thing as before, but instead of being two by two, it'll be four by four. Then we're going to take this chi matrix and use it as sort of a dummy process. We're going to take each of our six input states and we're going to apply the dummy process to it and then we're going to perform projections, all of each of the projections that we would normally do in our tomography, which will give us, again, 36 sort of dummy projectors, dummy count numbers. And then much, again, like the state tomography, we can just use these dummy count numbers to compare to the count numbers we actually have in a maximum likelihood set we have the exact same likelihood function, except this time we have 36 different terms instead of six different terms. And we have this normalization condition. This normalization condition is exactly just the trace preserving condition we discussed previously. And this just makes sure that the actual process that gets outputted is a genuine quantum process. And once you tune all of the 16 variables of your chi matrix to maximize the probability, that'll output your chi matrix, and well, then you're done. You have a chi matrix completely um, and uniquely established for your process, and if you ever want to see how it affects a given quantum state, you can again just construct, use the Pauli basis that you have and construct it using the formula we discussed back uh, here. All right, um, so that's all I have. Are there any questions? Oh yeah, good question. Yeah, sure. Um, a bit alien to this, so when you're discussing measuring processes can you describe it essentially as analyses of functions instead of analyses of sets? Um, so off of the top of my, can you, sorry, do you mind expanding on, upon that a little further? Uh, basically a function would have a domain and a map, right? <laughs> right. I'm just um, trying to understand, is that how you try to work on it or do you just work on it in a more native system? That's, I, that sound, so, that sounds like a reasonable way of um, thinking about it in that, yeah, I, I, yes, I, I believe so. Thanks. Can you discuss how we maybe could uh, quantify the errors in this kind of measurement? Like the error bar 
cards, for example, or the fidelity of the matrix, what's the best approach to use? Sure. So um, if I guess I'll, I can start with fidelity. Well, actually, I guess I can start with um, how you can quantify error bars. So for error bars, <coughs> we'll generally use a Monte Carlo approach in which you take the output of whatever your tomography is, you will then reproject it onto the states that um, you'd be projecting it onto, and use Poissonian t statistics to generate more sets of counts for that, feed them back through the tomography, and basically, you ba then you basically have a bunch of different um, density matrices which are similar but are I guess off by the Poissonian statistics in which the photons rely on. And that would give you error bars. As far as fidelity is concerned, <coughs> so if you were, say, trying to, if you were trying originally to create a specific state, it's not that you just have some random state that you're trying to figure out what it was. If you think you were trying to make a specific state, then you'll want to know how the state you measured compared with the state that you wanted. So the measurement you'll use there is called the fidelity. And so that just goes as <coughs> the trace of, you'll take the square root of, well, actually I guess I should write. So if you have two density matrices, sigma and rho, the fidelity between the two of them is the square root of rho times sigma times the square root of rho again. And then you take the square root of all of that, take the trace, and square it. Now this, uh, this fidelity will be 1 if the two states are identical, and it'll be 0 if the two states are orthogonal and somewhere in between otherwise. And so this is the measure that you'll use if you want to compare your measured state to the desired state. Cool. Any more questions? Yeah. Great.